Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Frank Sisson from the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies and the Hold More Research and Educational Consortium of the University of Alberta. Uh, this public lecture is part of a conference uh, on communism in hunger, a uh, comparison of the Kazakh, Ukrainian, all Soviet, and Chinese famines. Uh, uh, a topic that for us is really quite ambitious uh, comparatively and uh, if I may say so as a result of our first day's discussions uh, we have found uh, that combining uh, this broad geographic spectrum is really very good although we often considered in this day that perhaps uh, North Korea and Ethiopia and a number of other countries could be added but I think, think we have certainly found uh, much in common in the research strategies uh, that we have carried on uh, and as well uh, gotten ideas of what new topics uh, may be researched. And just a few words about uh, the whole the more research and educational consortium or DREC, uh, uh, what our proposal, what our, what our project is. Uh, in many ways, the Ukrainian famine, or below the more, has only really been studied academically for about 30 to 35 years. That is, although the event occurred in 1932-33, the Soviet Union never admitted that any famine had occurred on its territory. Indeed, even the word famine was not permitted uh, to be used. It was dangerous for people uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and this meant that the kind of study that other great tragedies, atrocities, genocides uh, had been given, uh, such as the Armenian genocide, uh, such as the Holocaust, did not really come to the, study, come to, uh, the scholarly field for the Holodomor. One of the reasons were that the archives were closed. They were held by the Soviet authorities who did not admit that the Holodomor had occurred. So in many ways, uh, uh, discussion and research was carried on largely in the communities of the Ukrainian diaspora of Europe and North America, uh, and often on the basis of survivor testimony. And those survivors largely reached uh, North America after World War II and could be, were eyewitnesses to the events that had occurred. And it was really only in the 1980s, starting with a number of projects, some of them here in Toronto, at, at, the at the Ukrainian Research and Documentation Center over on Svodina, uh, and at Harvard University, where a major project to study the famine in Ukraine uh, resulted in a major monograph by Robert Conquest, that we can say that the development the more was put on the scholarly agenda in the West. And then the first period of Glasnost in the Soviet Union meant for the first time Ukrainians could begin to speak out about the Holodomor and with the independence of Ukraine in 1991 could research the Holodomor. Uh, a year ago, the 80th anniversary, uh, we held a conference in this room and we dealt with what is those, what have those 30 years of research meant? Uh, how have they changed not only our understanding of the Holodomor, but our understanding of many other topics, the topic of genocide, the topic of Soviet history. Uh, did, did, had that research uh, in some ways illuminated a scholar's understanding of many other events? Uh, and what I think we've seen in the past day is uh, that in some ways that research was important. Our colleagues who study uh, the Kazakh, the Kazakh uh, famine uh, can in many ways turn to uh, some of the research done on Ukraine, uh, just as contemporary Kazakhs who are trying to refine their past and place the horrible tragedies of the early 1930s in context can look at what has been done in Ukraine. And we've seen as well that uh, uh, our colleagues who deal with China uh, as, have a whole series of problems to deal with uh, in how they will place that great tragedy of the Chinese people and, 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 and the tremendous number of people who perished in the context of that history. Uh, and uh, so uh, I think as a joint front, uh, we have many now common research projects to follow in the future. And one of the reasons we can carry on these activities and have been able to in the past year and will be doing so in the future 
is that the Tedrick Day Foundation, Family Foundation, has funded this project in Toronto, connected with the University of Alberta and the University of Toronto, and we're very pleased that Mr. James Emmerich could be here this evening with us and thank him for this. And I think uh, we can see that that thanks goes beyond uh, people in Ukrainian studies per se, but in the wider group of people who study such events. Uh, this evening we are privileged to have uh, uh, a distinguished lecture uh, a lecturer uh, who has in many ways shaped the field of Chinese studies and has now worked on a book comparing uh, the Soviet experience uh, with, the, with the Chinese. Uh, Professor Yi Ching Wu from our Asian Institute in East Asian Studies will introduce our this, our this evening's speaker uh, for us. Professor, Professor. Uh, okay, good evening. Uh, welcome back to the evening session after a full day of uh, intellectually intense and uh, incredible discussions. Uh, my name is Yishin Wu. I'm a social professor in East Asian Studies. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Lucien Bianco. Uh, professor Bianco, the name Lucien Bianco really didn't need too much introduction in the field of Chinese history or East Asian Studies. Uh, Lucien Bianco is really the, one of the best known names uh, for the book that he published in 1971. I mean, the, the book was first published in French in 1967, The Origins of Chinese Revolution, 1915 to 1949, which was published in English by Stanford University Press in 1971. And that uh, is the classic, the seminal uh, work on the history of Chinese communism, and I should say that generations of Chinese scholars or East Asian scholars began their graduate school reading that book in the first several years, at least I did in my first year of graduate school. And uh, I should also mention uh, at least two of Professor Bianco's works you know, uh, among many of his writings in both English and Chinese, but two uh, books that are available in the English language are particularly noteworthy. One is the uh, peasant, Peasants Without a Party, Grassroot Movement in Chinese Central China, that was published by Amy Sharp in 2001. And the other was the Wretched Rebels, Rural Disturbances on the Eve of the Chinese Revolution, that was published by Harvard University Press in 2010. And in both books, uh, Professor Bianco, in contrast to many scholars, who focus, many scholars of the Chinese Revolution who focus on the Chinese communist led peasant movement, develop the old and original argument that <coughs> peasant resistance and politics, such as uh, tax and food protests, secret society conflicts, uh, opium struggles, or communal conflicts, so on and so forth, were in fact largely unmediated by the vanguardist revolutionary party, and that's really a, a profound very interesting and original argument. Uh, and I should mention that the book Peasant Without Party uh, won the Joseph Levins Award from the Association for Asian Studies in 2003, and that is the highest honor in the field of modern Chinese history. Uh, and the uh, title of Opera of Bianco's talk tonight is uh, How Soviet and Chinese Communists Deal Dealt with the Peasantry and Comparison. So let's welcome President Yankel. 